Thank you very much for the kind in, uh, introduction. I would like to thank also Dr. Schwartz for giving me this opportunity to speak before you. Thank you very much for the audience. And I would like to talk about something which has not been talk, talked over in the complete convention. It concerns the coffee proteins. Uh, let me try to give you some idea about the background. Coffee came to us some many years back. So I think so it's not an oil food. The coffee beans are not a food, no oil foods. So the, I hope that the coffee bean proteins are also not no oil foods. That was my background. And I started res my research on coffee proteins. So I just want to bring, you know, I think so most of you know, are working with coffee. So you know that, uh, sorry, uh, most of you are working with coffee. And okay, and you know that uh, coffee arabica and coffee robusta are the most common ones. Coffee coffee alibareca is coming; it's getting very interesting. And I've been working on the coffee for a long time, but my intention is to con uh, work with bioactive compounds, with secondary plant metabolites, which are present in the coffee. Uh, they are responsible for a many of the biological properties which you have heard in the last two, three lectures. And uh, they can differ depending on different conditions, graphical areas of cultivation, post-harvest processing, etc. So we have got these coffee beans. We have got the different waste products which we talked today about. Uh, and uh, we saw that peak amount is always wasted. And what uh, is interesting is the what remains is the coffee bean which is used. So let us have a look at the concentration of different components in the coffee beans. Most important, I would like to point to chlorogenic acids and the proteins and the free amino acids. That's my interest. I've been working with them and I'm interested in the interaction of these two compound classes. So in chlorogenic acids, when we refer to chlorogenic acid, they are mono ferrolicinic acids. Some nine components are the major ones. Literature shows that up to, up to 50 to 60 components are present in coffee. The 5 sequa or 5 chlorogenic acid is the most prominent one, which makes about 60% of the chlorogenic acids. And we got 8 to 12% proteins. And the free amino acids, among them glutamine, uh, glutamine, glutamic acid, asparagine acid, and asparagine. So among the proteins, the major one is storage alpha proteins. Storage alpha proteins is a plant storage protein found in many of the plants, soya bean, other beans, etc. So let us go further. I'll try to divide, oh sorry, I cannot get back. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we can divide the plant proteins or general proteins into those which are responsible for structural, metabolic, and functional properties and the storage proteins. F storage proteins, F has come from the sedimentation and it is related to the molecular mass of the proteins and it composes about 45% of the total proteins in the endosperm of the coffee. Some literature gives 5 to 7% of the dry matter uh, is, a, is given by LFS protein or from the storage protein. It comes from the storage protein. Some literature give up to 15% of the coffee bean dry matter. So there are different uh, information about coffee print and we can continue. So if I looked up the database here, Uniprot, I find 82,000 proteins which are coming from the protein and four sequences, amino acid sequences, wherefore alpha storage protein. We tried to compare these uh, alpha storage proteins and found that they are very similar, so we concentrated on one of these. There are seven proteolytic active uh, enzymes, which is very interesting, while they can break down these proteins. Secondly, we have polyphenol oxidase, which is very interesting, while it can oxidize the chlorogenic acid and provides the basis for complex prote protein Chlorogenic interactions. So, and that's my field. So let us have a look at the uh, LFS proteins. They are assembled from two chains. Uh, oh, sorry. They are assembled in two chains: alpha acidic chains and the beta acidic chain. They are differentiated due to the molecular weight. They are bound together by a disulfide uh, bridge, 
They are formed in monomers. These combine together to a trimer, and all together you have a hexamer, which has globular in, uh, structure and looks like this. These are connected with cysteine. These are the two cysteines which form this disulfide bond. They are 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 uh, are are located when you use immunolocalization of the coffee legumin, you will find them, they are located in the majority of storage, large storage vacuoles that count for, for most of the cells. So, let us go further. If uh, you try to extract those proteins, it depends on the conditions you apply. If you use a, sorry, if you use a technical uh, processing aid like polyvinyl polyvinylpropylene, then it binds the phenolic compounds and you get a very light colored protein sample. If you work with uh, another one, polyamide, as a technical assistant, then you get very dark colored proteins. If you work with ascorbic acid, you get dark colored proteins. So if you work at pH 8, you get green colored proteins. And so we took this as best option and tried to get real good amount of proteins and tried to investigate them further. So. Before going further, I would like to explain to you how the color comes. The chlorogenic acid contains a uh, auto-positioned OH groups. These are liable to oxidation. They can be oxidized to chinon. This can provide browning, as is the case, as is the case with these uh, two possibilities. On the other hand, the chinon formed can interact with nucleophiles, that means with proteins, amino acids, and cause reaction products, which are capable of going further reactions. So this is where we concentrated our work on. So here I just show you an example of different colored adducts which are formed between chlorogenic acid and different amino acids. Interestingly, you will see that tryptophan can provide red colored adducts interesting for biopolymers. Also, uh, the lysine product, which is the most uh, uh, available amino acid in the proteins, causes green colored products. So at pH 8, you get green colored products, while the interaction between chlorogenic acid and lysine occurs. So if you go further, uh, the first methods to identify these proteins was electrophoresis. It was used from Montovan in, from Nestle. And he showed that the proteins can be separated and they are already modified during ripening and maturation of the coffee beans. So already on the trees themselves, they are matured and modified. So we, on our hand, concentrated on the esterase page where you separated the proteins. We tried to get this protein and worked with them further. We cut them out. We digested these proteins and tried to allocate as shown here, red framed are the alpha chains, and these are beta chains, and try to allocate the modification to them. So we did uh, mass spectrometric methods and tried to find or tried to show different types of modifications. Here are the possibilities which we said are possible. Cysteine, for example, would react like this. Lysine could react like this. And if you look at the, the sequence here, we have got plenty of side chains from lysine, which are capable of interacting with chlorogenic acid. The same with the beta chain also. There are plenty of lysines which are capable of interacting. As a result, we could show that different types of modifications are possible in the coffee proteins, depending on the different conditions and how they have been extracted. So going further, we said, OK, let's try to see if this uh, the lysine rests are available for modification. We could do a tridimensional structure. We could show that all these lysine chains are capable of modification. They can interact. Only thing is that the alpha chain, which is shown here, is on the surface of the protein. So it's more available for modification, whereas the beta chain is inside the molecule. So you must imagine a tennis ball. Outside is the alpha chain of the protein. Inside is the beta chain. It's not available for modification, but the alpha chain is so, so it's more or less there for further modification. So if we go further, we did, we said, OK, this is on protein uh, level. Let's go to the peptide level. So we did following, we, we had a coffee 
protein extracted, it was already modified. We broke down the peptides by digestion using trypsin, for example. It's a very specific uh, enzyme. We cut the proteins after lysine and arginine. We get modified un and mo unmodified peptides. Modified ones are with uh, bound to CQA. We tried different enzymes, we tried different model proteins, and then we could fragment those and allocate using HPLC MS. MS different uh, modified peptides in all these different Arabica samples coming from different resources. The only difference is that they were processed uh, differently during the post-harvest treatment. So, if you go further, we could show that we could find both unmodified peptides of the alpha chain and the modified peptides of the beta chain, uh, unmodified uh, peptides of the beta chain and those which are modified. We went further and could show that depending on the post-harvest treatment, there is an increase in this type of modification for under conditions of wet monsoon, you get a higher modification of the proteins. So since we are talking about functional proteins, we need to go into functional properties. So I will go there. So first, before I start, we could show that the structure again, there's this alpha chain is the major peptide which is modified and here on the beta chain, this is the one. And let's go further. So functional properties. So we started with the solubility test. And you can see already here, this is a typical fava bean protein here, and we compared it to the extracted proteins. And you can see we have a very good solubility in the range of four to six, which is the typical processing, food processing uh, pH, which normally is used in many other industries. So there are very good uh, potentials for this purpose. And solubility is the main property determining the different protein properties, gelling, forming emulsion. We concentrated on the emulsion properties. We could, before that, we determined the antioxidative capacity of the proteins. And you can see here that depending on the different method used to extract the proteins, we could get different antioxidative capacity of the protein themselves because they have bound the chlorogenic acid. And the bound chlorogenic acid is still available for further interactions. Don't forget it. Just think about ibuprofen and lysine ibuprofen. Why are we taking lysine ibuprofen? And this is what we are experiencing here. So we are having lysine and chlorogenic acid. We are transferring, making it easier for chlorogenic acid to come into the body and cause some different reactions. So going further, we found out that we could make good emulsions with the same quality as the fava beans. And we could find out that they are very effective in, uh, in giving a good quality for the stability of the emulsions. So now we've got a good emul emulgator. So we said, OK, let's go further and try to see if this antioxidative protein can be used for pharmaceutical preparations or food preparation. So we use lutein ester. Lutein ester is now a carotenoid, which is liable to oxidation via UVBs or via heating, etc. So we said, OK, let's take this and capsule it inside the proteins. And we made the emulsions of it. And you can see that we could find that faba bean was not very effective or oil was not effective, but the proteins modified were effective in uh, protecting such liable uh, compounds like lutein ester for, for microcapsulation. So thinking about this further, I think so there is a big potential in the coffee proteins. We could use them, uh, but before as Madame told us nutrition is also very important. So let's have a look at the nutritional properties. OK, we tried to hydrolyze those proteins, and we could produce also amino acids. And we published these results recently. There are very interesting results here also. And we said, OK, let's go further and test them. So we did some animal experiments. We didn't use coffee proteins because we didn't have a control. So we used soy proteins, modified them with chlorogenic acid, and compared those with the red animal experiments. We could find out 
that the biological values is only slightly reduced, as you can see, but it's significantly reduced. The net protein utilization can be reduced. And if you go further, the pedicas, then you will see that mostly lysine is affected because lysine interacts with the chlorogenic acid. So keeping that in mind, we need to be considered that when using function or functionalizing the coffee bean proteins, there's always a possibility that the lysine con content not, might not be. It's an essential amino acid is needed for the development of the organism, so this should be compensated. So we know that coffee, co coffee proteins can be modified enzymatically or chemically, enzymatically while using the polyphenol oxidase, chemically in, by just changing the pH, you don't need to do anything else. And the modification occurs to proteins and peptides, giving possibilities to change colors of the food system, etc. And it is functionally improved via this modification solubility emulsion activity or behavior. And uh, keep in mind that essential amino acid is always limited in its availability while it reacts with the chlorogen. Now think about the mylar reaction. Mylar reaction occurs with the amino groups, and the amino group is needed for the mylar reaction and the aroma and etc. So I think so. The melanoins. You talked about melanoins today. Brown colored pigments. I think so. The proteins are partly in, integrated in those compounds. Have antioxidant capacities, and nobody has looked at it up. So there is a big potential to check spent coffee and to see what can be extracted there, which type of amino acids are modified present there. Why not try to find out new uses for the spent coffee? Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for your presentation. I actually was fascinated by um, the color complexes you showed between the proteins and chlor chlorogenic acid. Do you think this can explain what we saw this morning in, in our coffee leaf teas with the different brown colors that this is also some form of a protein complex? Oops. It could be a complex, it could be an oxidation. The green color is typical reaction product which occurs when you allow chlorogenic acid to react with the proteins or amino acids. Mm -hmm. If you look at the amino acids, most of them were green colored. The only exception was tryptophan. And tryptophan, you can hardly find it free so if it's free, it will give red colored complex. If it's not free, it, or if it's on the, on, the, on the end terminal where it is free, then it might give a red colored complex. But uh, we don't have it, so we have to live with what we have. So, but, but if you cut down the proteins, and if you get tryptophan free, and let it interact with the chlorogenic, then you'll get red colored peptides or proteins. So that's possible, but nobody has checked it because nobody has gone there so far. So we are just on the starting edge of that part, and I think so it promises to have a future. I hope we can follow it up. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there questions? Yes, to those. Yes, I have to. Wait, wait, he's coming. Exactly. exactly. I, I agree, but the thing is that normally the soy protein, they are sticky to the isoflavones, and then did you remove the isoflavone from there because they are sticky by Meyer reaction or uh, it no. bounds also to the lysine and arginine, and probably uh, if you don't remove it with treatment with uh, sodium uh, hydroxide or something like this, you can have this also this interaction in the protein that you're using as control. This is my curiosity because okay. I found very interesting just to use because uh, because they are 11s at the at the end of the day. Even when the coffee is not a legume, but they they have 11s. I understand your isoflavones are very famous that they are present in the soy beans. They interact with the proteins, yeah. but the interaction is not covalent. It, it is not, but the chlorogenic acid isn't. It's chlorogenic is a covalent interaction. 
Yeah. Whereas it, it, it's not. It is, and sometimes it is no, not. No, we ch tested all the isoflavin, genistein, datesein, etc., with the different proteins, and they don't bind covalently to the proteins. The only possibility that a substance can bound or phenolic compound can bind yes. covalently to the protein is that yeah. the auto position. And yeah. most of the isoflavones don't have this this structure to interact with the with the proteins. So uh, you are right. There are isoflavones, but they are not bound covalently. So you can remove them if you want. Yes, but did you? We didn't remove because ah. our reasoning was that we need a uh, LFS protein. Yes. We extracted the S under basic conditions. So I think most of it's removed. So when you prepare LFS protein from soy, yeah. Yeah, you work at pH 8. So you are okay. mostly removing the isoflavones. We checked it, we tried to extract it, but we could not find it. No, this is a pH for the Maya reaction, the, 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 the one, but yes, the, it was, sounds curious for me that you, you were using the 11S from the soy protein as a yes, model exactly. for the 11S of the coffee. But uh, yes, uh, we have some paper in this thesis that I mentioned before uh, with uh, Ferranti, that is proteomic, and uh, we see the interaction. Of, uh, we found the two interaction with the chlorogenic acid and the and the uh, and we use it BSA in this time and also soy protein. The, we see the two interaction, the covalent one and the uncovalent one. So we concentrate only on the covalent possibilities because we think the the, the compound needs to come to the the intestinal tract yes. and survive there, and then yes. it can be absorbed, and, and then the it is possible that there. it might yes. reach the site of action. So the question is, if it reaches the liver, yeah. then it can work there. Yeah. So the position is that it needs to be covalently modified, it needs to be absorbed, like using the amino acid transporter, yeah. because amino acid is acid, then it might need to come to the site of kneading, where it's yeah. needed, and there it can uh, uh, work there as it should. Yeah, the That's the is, background. Yes, uh, the thing coming is, back if to they the are not soy. digested, if they are not digested, they go to the feces, uh, or they can be digested by can be digested. any organism, that is what Jenny and say. They can be digested. We tried yeah. also the same experiment with the wet, we, uh, whey proteins, milk whey proteins, and we found the same reaction. So it's not only soy, we tried also, because but we wanted to compare soy plant proteins with plant proteins, and we did the same experiment with whey proteins and faba bean proteins also. Yes, so, uh, and we found um, Perhaps, yes. are there yes. any other questions? I do not want to interrupt this, but we also yeah. have the coffee break. I, I, yes, there I, is I think another short. This is a perfect uh, uh, maybe <laughs> moment to use the coffee break, and, yeah. and, and, and you go yeah. deep in discussion, and we form round tables in different groups depending on how deep you go in proteins, <laughs> uh, which is... Thank you. I think this was a sign by the organizers to stop, so I thank, thank you. you very, very yeah, much again you. for being here. Yes, thank and you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Enjoy.